We are live. Welcome Hi. to the June 2019 Draft to Digital Ask Us Anything. This is going to be an hour-long program. It's going to be a combination of questions you guys sent in in advance, as well as questions that come from the comments on the Draft to Digital Facebook page. But before we get into that, I want to uh, basically talk about who are these three handsome men who are hanging out together here? Uh, Dan, why don't we start with you? Hey, Dan Wood. I am the Director of Author Relations at Draft Digital. Excellent. And who's the good-looking guy above you on the screen there? I am Kevin Tomlinson. I'm uh, the Director of uh, Marketing at Draft Digital, among other things. So Excellent. And uh, my name is Mark Lefebvre, and I am the Director of Business Development. And we're going to be uh, taking some questions. We also have our good pal, Alyssa, who is hanging out in the back end in the wings, pulling some of the strings and helping us manage some of this stuff. So um, we're going to say, hey, Alyssa, thanks for hanging out with us here, too. And uh, we'll hopefully we'll be able to convince her to come into the room with us and answer some of your questions in a future one. But right now, I just want to give you a bit of an overview of the format. So as we mentioned, we had uh, some of the people who pre-registered for this had submitted some questions, some amazing questions. We had about 500 different questions come in. We're obviously not going to be able to answer them all. There were some questions that were very specific and technical. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll be hearing from the Draft Digital Customer Care team if you haven't already about you know an issue you might have been having or whatever. There were some feature requests uh, that have gone into our feature request channel. We'll probably send you a note saying thanks for that. Uh, and then we tried to, because some of the questions overlapped, we tried to come up with a summary and say, well, these five people ask this kind of question. So we're going to go back and forth between some of those pre uh, sent questions, as well as some of your live questions to keep you guys engaged. So hopefully that gives you guys uh, a bit of an idea of what's going to happen. But before uh, we we do anything else, I'm going to pop up the very first question that came in. And this was a question that actually came in from Dale. Thanks, Dale. The question is for Dan. Uh, I'm, I'm actually directing the question at Dan. <laughs> what is the biggest missed opportunity on draft to digital for most indie authors already using the platform? You know, I, I think there are three things that I see people not using quite enough. Uh, the first one, I think Mark will agree with me, with me about this one because we both are huge advocates of using territorial pricing. Uh, just you can set your price and all the other currencies however you want. Um, when you have sales, you want to run uh, the sale in that currency as well. Uh, so the book market is so much bigger than just the U.S. And so we encourage you to look at the territorial pricing um, you know, some of the markets can handle uh, a higher price than others. And so uh, I, I would look into that. It's something that I think is just a really cool tool we offer. Uh, the second one is pre-orders. We always harp on pre-orders, but um, it's such a powerful tool. And so many of our retailers use it for merchandising choices. And so uh, at draft to digital you can set up pre-orders at Barnes & Noble, at Apple, at Kobo, um, and Tolino. And so you can set that up, have it ready, so that when someone finishes your last book, uh, and if they love it, they can go buy the next one, and they'll get it as soon as it's released. The final thing I would say is our In Matter tool. Like I think it's one of the coolest things we've built. Um, you know, for anywhere that we're distributing your book, we can make a list at the end of your book of all your other books and include retailer-specific links at each retailer. And so the Barnes and Noble version has Barnes and Noble links. Apple has Apple links. That's just will save you so much time. When you add a new book, we'll go and update all the old books. I mean, hours and hours of time you could be saving. Cool. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Dan. And so just a reminder to folks who are watching this live, if a question comes up that you want to ask, like maybe it's a follow-up to something really cool that Dan or Kevin just said, go ahead and put that in the comments. Alyssa's keeping an eye out that. She's going to poke us so that we can get that popped up on the screen. Um, but before um, we look at those, I'm going to jump over to ask the next question that came in. And this is a question that came in from George. And this one's going to be going towards Kevin. So uh, the question is, I understand the ebook will go out to places checked on the next page. And this is, I think, when he's setting up uh, the book to be published. He says, but how do I check on the results, I guess, probably of where this is published? Uh, so in on the author dashboard once you've kind of gone through the process there's a there is a uh, and I and and someone's going to have to remind me what this page is now called but there's a page that actually shows you uh, the ebook the print it's like a little dashboard in itself it's you can show a few of your uh, like all the distribution everywhere everything's going what's in what stages 
uh, it's at kind of the end of that little process on uh, DraftDigital.com when you log into your author dashboard. That's where you. That's where you can get that, and you can also see that as soon as you log, log in and click on the My Books page, you get um, some little icons on the right hand side by the, each title that tell you what stage a book is in. I hope that answered that that question. <laughs> it sounds like it did answer that question. That's really really cool. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple uh, of different ways to do that. In other words, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and I think that's one of the joys is that there are always more than one way of doing something on Draft to Digital. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. For some of the functionality. Okay, cool. Always. All right. Like give you lots of different ways. <laughs> All righty. So I'm going to pop up the next question. Uh, this is one uh, that Angie asked, uh, and it's one that I am slated to answer. So uh, in addition to universal links, uh, what's the benefit of using draft to digital to list all our books? Um, great question, Angie. I think so. Well before I started working uh, draft to digital, I used the the draft to digital book links for a couple things that I thought was beneficial. Well, when it's automatically created, you get a really ugly uh, GUID, like a, a combination of letters and numbers. So it's books to read dot com slash, you know, it sounds like like the way you might spell out a belch or something like that. Uh, and that's just the you know the systematic computer way of of creating a, a unique identifier. But what you can do is you can customize that identifier and and make it um, uh, what I would call a vanity URL, or you can make it a URL that's customized to something specific. So, for example, um, and and uh, because I'm traditionally published, I use it for both my traditionally published books and my self-published books. You don't actually have to have published a book through draft to digital in order to use that. So every single one of my books that's been published has the actual... Um, uh, name of it. So, for example, if I'm uh, talking about one of the most recent books that I co-wrote with Shana Krishnasamy called Macabre Montreal, and I'm on a radio program talking about it, I can say, well, you can get it at any retailer. Just go to books2read.com slash macabre Montreal. Or if I'm talking about one of my thrillers, I can say go to books2read.com slash evasion. So that's one of the benefits. The other benefit would be the fact that you can actually see where people are clicking on. You see right now it's currently showing you the top three places where customers are clicking. So you can kind of get a, a measure for, well, when people are coming to this page, where are they clicking? And I do know that we have plans in the works to expand that. We have more data. And uh, and I know the three of us are really excited about helping authors get even more data on, on, on the behavior and what's going on. So I know analytics are really, really important for authors. So for me, as an author myself, that's kind of something that's really, really important. Definitely. You know, I kind of read that question a little bit differently, though. I think he was looking for other things in addition to the universal book links oh, that are, uh, like, reasons to use so hit D &D. Us with, Yeah, please hit us um, with that. You know, I, I think one of the things we do great is we make tools that save you a lot of time. And so um, there's a lot of the distributors where you can go direct, and we try to make that easy because all of our distribution is opt-in, so you choose where you want to go with this. Um, but it's so easy to just come to our website, upload it everywhere. You just upload one manuscript, and you can choose all the places you want it to go to. And then if you make a change to your description, if you change a price, uh, we'll change it everywhere at once for you. And so it's just hours and hours of time saving, and the Apple will accept it and won't reject it for something because Apple's kind of particular. So, And part of that whole update everywhere thing is we'll update the metadata for that book. So things like your also buy... Uh, page, which is all the books that are also by you, uh, we can update that for you on all of your books automatically. So that helps with keeping everything current. So if people pick up something from your back catalog, they can see that you have X number of books and a new book just came out, you know, this month or something. Excellent, excellent. And I thought I would just pop up this comment from uh, Allison who said, I love having the custom links with the book name instead of the computer generated link. And yeah, I, uh, I agree with you on that, uh, Allison. That's really, really cool. I like all the computer generated characters. It makes me feel <laughs> official. Yeah, the way, yeah. We do have a question. Uh, uh, Alyssa has popped a question into Slack that we might want to. Yeah, uh, as well. And so Richard had sent uh, a question earlier. I didn't get a chance to key, uh, type it into the title card because I think that was one of the ones that the customer care team was going to handle. But it's oh. right here. So there's Richard with the beautiful green eye on his icon. And and the question that Richard asked, uh, go ahead and uh, read it and uh, and answer it, Kevin. Sure. Uh, it's Let me find it. Uh, why did I, it I can... so... maybe, maybe this was a question we were going to ask um, 
or let someone else answer. But let's answer it on air. Why does it take so long to receive payment for royalties? Um, who wants to field that? I've got to. Uh, I can handle it. Okay. So royalties are fascinating because some of the, you know, Amazon kind of set a precedent of Amazon pays for the most part every month. Uh, you know, it trails for some of their international markets, but it's generally 30 days. Most of the other majors do that. With all of our other uh, partners we work with, like libraries, with international retailers, it kind of varies how often they pay us. And so sometimes, like uh, Kobo, for instance, is about 60 days after the sale. Um, part of that's because Kobo is also working with other partners. And so Kobo is working with companies like WH Smith uh, in the UK. Um, uh, what's the French one? Um, FNAC. Yeah, FNAC. And so they're gathering money from those companies and then they're passing it to us. So towards the beginning or towards the end of the month and the beginning of the next month, we start getting in the payments slowly but surely from all of our retailers. Once we get all of those, then we start making payments. Um, there's no way really to speed it up because we're just waiting to be paid ourselves. Uh, but basically, as soon as we're getting in the money, we're getting ready. It saves everyone money when we make one payment at once because there's all kinds of little financial charges. Um, I will give you like this little hint. Uh, if you're using PayPal as your payment method, they are by far the slowest because once we get paid, we didn't have to transfer money over to PayPal and they take some time to process it. I mean, it can be one to three days sometimes. And so I highly recommend uh, if you have another option that would work for you, uh, like, uh, you know, we do direct deposit, we do international direct deposit, uh, Payoneer, uh, all of those other electronic means are faster than PayPal. And so that's one way to kind of speed up how often you're getting paid. Um, but, you know, we try to pay as quickly as we can. Uh, we're always encouraging our, our partners and our uh, new partners to pay quicker because uh, we would like to get that money into your hands as quickly as possible. One thing we, we, we do want to stress, though, is as soon as is, if there is money in our account that's earmarked for you, you get it on that next pay period. So the 15th of each month is when we make the payments. So if there is money waiting for you, it doesn't stay with us for very long. <laughs> so. OK, cool. That is great. Uh, I noticed there was another question in here uh, and I'm just going to pop it up. So it's Lexi Rourke, who looks suspiciously like my friend Julie Strauss. Uh, Lexi Rourke, uh, virtual assistant here. Uh, good info here about pre-order capability at D2D. &D. So uh, I know that was a question that had come in, and 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 I thought it sounds like she's saying, oh, she's saying good pre-order information. I think so, yeah. Yeah. So thanks for for it's that comment. I, I thought she was asking about uh, strategies for pre-orders, but we, we, I'm yeah, gonna go off that. We only included a com a compliment in a our compliment. I threw in a compliment. Thank you for that, Lexi. But you I want to. One wanna... thing that we didn't mention about pre-orders. Yeah. None of the other retailers are other than Amazon are going to punish you if you need to move your day a little bit. And so that's another good tip. Oh, you know, with all of our partners, if you want to move a pre-order back because the book's taking a little bit longer than you thought, or if you want to, uh, you know, you finished it early and you want to go ahead and get it out to your readers a little bit earlier. Um, all of our partners will let you move that data around. And so it's really nice to have that. Hey, I want to say real quick a uh, hello to our, our beard buddy, Michael Bunker, who popped in just to just to. Oh, uh, you mean Michael Bunker looks. right here? Is this so Man. Michael? He says he doesn't have a question, but boy, do Dan and Kevin look really, really good is what he said. Because he said <laughs> gentlemen, which probably excludes me. All us beards <laughs> got to run together. I thought I was going to have the best like beard in this chat, but Bunker shows up. <laughs> Bunker shows up. Ruined there, everything. Okay. Uh, I just saw another live question come up, so I'm going to bring that up. Um, this is a question from, uh, I hope I pay, Irie Rees. And Irie says, uh, I'm planning to use my own ISBNs for all outlets. Uh, bought in the UK, that's an expensive option, but is it worth the outlay? ISBNs are kind of the, <laughs> the tricky <laughs> thing. Controversial. Uh, yeah. So our position on ISBNs uh, is one that is not shared by everybody, but for the most part, for an ebook, an ISBN is really kind of pointless. Uh, every retailer out there has their own inventory system. They're going to assign their own version of an ISBN. Amazon's is AISN. Uh, I think EISN is Nook. I don't remember, but it doesn't really matter because they're all essentially 
the same idea. They're just inventory control systems. If uh, if you're talking about print, that's a whole other thing. Mm. Uh, but if you're distributing through us, we'll give you free ISBNs. So, um, you know, the only thing that um, people kind of hang up on is if we give you an ISBN, it lists draft to digital as the publisher. Uh, but you know, nobody ever goes, look, we, that doesn't mean anything. Honestly, it doesn't, we don't own anything. We're not trying to control your book in any way. Uh, it's just the way it works out when we purchase the ISBNs. Uh, but nobody goes looking for a book by the publisher. And you can also list your publishing house name. If you have a publishing imprint as the publisher anyway, on those sites, uh, yeah. and through us. Now, can I add something to that? Um, add all you want. So the, the fact that Irie's already invested in ISBNs and has her own ISBNs, this is if you're trying to, because again, um, my, my history as a bookseller and, and, and um, submissions of ISBNs to New York Times and USA Today and other bestseller lists are tracked by the ISBN. So if you're using uh, the ASIN on Amazon and a, and a draft to digital ISBN on some sites and your ISBN on others, the the sales data may not link back to the same book, which may mean you may not make it onto the bestseller lists. I know it's a small thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm a very anal about metadata, so I always want to know that this edition or this ebook edition is this ISBN, whether you see it on, on Apple or Kobo or Amazon or anywhere else. So for me, I, I, I kind of, uh, I'm particular about wanting to make sure that it's that ISBN. Uh, and, and, and I've made that mistake uh, in the past where I use the Kobo dummy ISBN and I use the draft to digital ISBN, and then I use the ASIN, so it looks like it's three different books, even though it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I actually did neglect to... I, I, I noticed after you said that that she said she already had her ISBN, so okay. that's okay, too. <laughs> You've already invested. <laughs> Go ahead and use them. All righty. Uh, I saw that uh, there was uh, something else here. Uh, actually, just a quick uh, quick comment I'm going to pop up from Anne. So Anne is joining us from another part of the world, and she says, it's 3 in the morning. Anne, wow. I would have brewed some God. coffee for you. I actually have a glass of Writer's Tears Irish whiskey. Maybe that is more appropriate at 3 in the morning than coffee. But uh, cheers to you for being up so early. Thanks for joining us here. That's dedication right there. <laughs> that is. That, that is a drive to learn. Let we uh, Now <laughs> the pressure's on. We have to actually produce something worthwhile. I know, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is cool. So uh, I am going to pop this up as a teaser. So Anne sends, she sent this question in. I want to make sure it's addressed. What's the best way to promote on D2D? And that's just a teaser for later. Because <laughs> so, we, we are going to be talking about that quite a bit uh, later on as, as we move on. Uh, and I, guys, I just I think Alyssa has just shared something with us and I haven't had a chance to see what that said. Um, but in the meantime... I'm going to pop up another question that came in from Martha. And the question is, um, can authors using Draft2Digital take advantage of the promotions slash offerings provided by various platforms such as Kobo, or do they uh, only offer those options for authors using their platform directly? And and that is something that I know uh, was sent in as well, but I thought well, maybe we should talk about that now. And I think, Dan, I'm going to fire this one over in your direction. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, we work with Kobo, we work with Apple, we work with Barnes & Noble. Um, a ton of the different retailers give us promotional opportunities. Um, we've been kind of using, they, they work in different ways at different retailers. And so um, many of you who've worked with us have gotten an email from us about different promotional opportunities. Uh, we just started using forms to help us gather more uh, nominations and everything. So we nominate things you know, nearly every week or every few weeks, we nominate to different promotional opportunities. Uh, some of those places like Kobo will have a theme. Like sometimes it's uh, one of the ones we're uh, working on now is the Dog Days of Summer. And so it's books on sale, but especially they want books with dogs on the cover, you know, because of the Dog Days theme. Um, sometimes they have holiday sales. Uh, we had a big nonfiction uh, sale that we did recently with Overdrive for their libraries. Um, and so what we do is we go through and we kind of look through all of our users that have books that are alive at that retailer. And we take like the top 100 who've done sales, top 500. Uh, we send out emails about them. Uh, we are working to eventually kind of incorporate those promotions onto our dashboard. And so you can see what all is available out there. But right now, the best way to know about the promotions is to watch your emails and make sure that you've, uh, you know, 
your draft to digital emails aren't going into a different folder that you might not see, like your junk mail. Um, when you see those emails, take part in them. Uh, they're great opportunities. They don't cost any money. Um, and so it's just another opportunity to uh, promote your book a little bit more. Okay. Now, speaking of promotions, I'm just going to uh, jump back to a, a question that was submitted ahead of time. And this uh, came in from Cindy, and it basically was, how do you make books to read uh, work for me? Beyond a link on my website, um, what more should I be doing uh, using those free tools, basically? And I think Anyone? I was probably, uh, yeah, I, you guys put my name beside that one. Uh, so I think one of the things um, that I often see uh, with authors is oftentimes they'll mention their book is on Amazon, and I get it because Amazon is the world's biggest bookstore, but also making sure that when you use the books to read link that you say this is a link to every single retailer. Actually, for that matter, even if you are exclusive to Amazon, Amazon has eight different websites in all these different zones. So they have the .com and the .ca and the .de and the .dot the UK, et cetera, et cetera. And so even if you're uh, only on Amazon, that actually helps people around the world, like outside of uh, the US, for example, go to the right site where they can actually purchase uh, the books. And I know people can purchase uh, books from Amazon.com, so that's useful. The other thing that I would suggest uh, look into, and this is something we're really excited about uh, doing more, is on uh, or via Books to Read, you have the free author page, and uh, Kevin talked about that. But you can do more with that and custom carousels. So it's kind of like you can build your own merchandising of books that you want. Maybe it's favorite yeah. books or cross promotion saying so if you like you know game of thrones you might like my fantasy novels as well and you can kind of mix and match and there will probably be more uh cross promotion discoverability uh, opportunities coming up as we continue to add more enhancements to that anything else gentlemen that i'm missing yeah we we actually have three right now like three products we call them products built around our universal book links uh and i we've kind of disco discussed what UBLs are, right? Or not? Yeah. Okay. So um, the three things that we've got built around that, we've mentioned uh, author pages and uh, right, uh, the book pages that we uh, that are kind of linked together. We've also got the reading lists that you can build. And one of the advantages of all those, by the way, is if you have affiliate links uh, or affiliate codes from some of the ret retailers like uh, Amazon, Apple, Kobo, uh, even Smashwords, you can embed those affiliate links in the Universal Book Links, and then all those uh, products we offer will have that embedded. So if you create a, a reading list of books, let's let's say that you create a reading list of your book plus books that are similar, right? And you're pushing this out to your mailing list, and uh, you get the people on that maybe to push it out to their mailing list. It works for a nice cross promotion, but then you can get affiliate dollars for when people click through and buy. Uh, books on those pages. So just a little fun extra cash. <laughs> That's cool. I kind of like that fun extra cash. Uh, I'm going to go, <laughs> go back to, so Richard uh, said, um, if you answered this, sorry about that, but he says, so is uh, there a global dashboard for sales across all platforms? Um, so for example, there's different charts where I can look at, you know, Apple sales and Nook sales and Kobo sales, for example. But if my books are on several platforms, is there is there some sort of pre-built uh, chart or graph that shows all your sales on a single screen? Yes. If you go to uh, draft to digital and log in, you can click on my reports. And uh, over on the left-hand side of that page, there are charts there, and you can see all of your sales uh, and break them down by sales channel, by book, uh, lots of options there. So that's where you can kind of see everything in one place. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. Um, now, Irie has a question that sort of ties into one that I was just about to pop up, so I'll pop hers up first, and it's about... Uh, a, a large catalog, uh, working hard on them. I'm not sure whether to use Vellum since they're uh, picture textbooks for juniors. Um, can I shout for help if need be? So this is a question about, and obviously Vellum are, are friends of ours. Uh, yeah. Any any comments on on using that for getting your books published? For picture books? Yeah. Was that the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would use Vellum. Uh, well, okay, you can use Vellum and if you happen to have access to uh, Adobe InDesign and know how to use it, or you can hire someone to use it, that will, that might end up giving you uh, the best options for layout, but Vellum handles that stuff pretty well. I don't know that our automated layout handles picture books very well, but we can help with that if it's something you want to do. 
it, so it does not. Have, um, yeah, it's not, it's not great it, it's for really fiction. aimed at genre fiction. Um, it can work with nonfiction, but there's stuff that has like, uh, say you have a lot of footnotes or endnotes. Um, that's where you might want to use vellum or talk to like a professional formatter. Mm -hmm. um, picture books are interesting. Like picture books did not make the same digital transformation uh, because they, they add in a couple of different little other parts where pictures uh, are bigger. So the file sizes are bigger. Some of the platforms like Amazon uh, are going to charge you for delivery costs. And so sometimes picture books uh, can end up not netting you very much money uh, for digital. Um, there are special considerations for it. Um, there's a lot of groups where people are being successful uh, with picture books, but there's kind of ins and outs that you're going to want to look into. Um, I would say, in, in this case, our automated form, uh, you know, we have a free formatting tool, probably not the best for doing it with picture books. Uh, Vellum might be a good, good one to work with, um, but a lot of people are using things like o Adobe InDesign. Okay. Thanks, Dan. And that kind of leads to sort of one of the, the other questions related to conversion. And, and I believe this question is probably related to our conversion tool. So the question's kind of, so, you know, you're using a Word document. Um, so the conversion of books, um, and, and this was asked by, so John and Jeff and Camilio and, and other folks asked questions along this line. So when, when they're using Word, uh, it, what's the best way to, to use it with images? Uh, maybe how they link them in there. Is there an optimal side? And how do you ensure the image is centered? And and then and I guess the comics is kind of related to the picture question. Um, probably you sort of answered that one. But what about other other images in a in a regular like a novel that might maybe has some images in it? I would say uh, on the comics thing just specifically because I saw that question. Um, it's a different format most of the time that people uh, read comics in. It's the CBR format, which is different than EPUB and Mobi that Amazon uses. Uh, there's a Comixology has their own platform for self-publishing your comics, but they would be in the CBR format, which is different than what we do. Um, with other images, um, our conversion tool uh, does allow you to insert some images here and there. Um, it's kind of a trial and error process. Um, again, like we mentioned on that last question, it's not, if you have a lot of images, it's probably not going to be the best thing for you, um, but you can put those images in and just kind of play around with it. Since our converter, you know, generally it's done within a few seconds. You can kind of change your Word document, see what how it looks, upload it, see how we converted it. Um, you know, for very specific questions, because it's very different, like depending on the size of image, the dimensions, you know, if it's a real wide image or if it's a real thin image, uh, I would recommend contacting our customer support uh, our operations team has seen a lot of different things, and so the, they're going to be the best that help you. In you know, unfortunately, there's not like one size fits all answer to this question in particular. Yeah. Um, we kind of saw we had a lot of people kind of asking also with our uh, automated conversion tool. We have uh, these beautiful graphics that you can include uh, that are kind of they're designed to be genre specific. So you know, like dragons for fantasy. Uh, the little looking glass for mysteries. Yep. Uh, you know, several people were asking, you know, can I upload my own custom images? Uh, right now, we, we don't do that because of uh, copyright becomes an issue, making sure that the images you're uploading to us uh, aren't owned by someone else. Uh, but it is something we've heard. We're adding more and more templates. Um, you know, we would love to, to have it where we could take custom images. We just haven't solved the legal issue of it yet. Right. Also, uh, when it comes to images and ebooks, uh, it's just not a format that's designed for uh, precise uh, linking of images to a specific location or layout. And so you might just kind of want to consider giving up on trying to uh, put a, an image in a specific spot in every ebook, uh, mostly because ebooks reflow, which is kind of the point, so that they can. Um, you know, they're going to reflow depending on the read, um, what reading device they're on, uh, the font size that the reader cho chooses, that sort of thing. Uh, which also leads us to, you know, a lot of people want to try to lock in the, the fonts and, uh, you know, make sure that the layout stays in a specific way. They get their layout perfect in Word, and so they want it to appear that way in the ebooks. That's just not the way ebooks are designed. 
Uh, so you, you might want to kind of relax your grip a little on that, <laughs> and which I know is going to irk some people, but it's just the, the fact that ebooks are all about uh, the reader. The reader gets to adjust their font, their page size, you know, that sort of thing. And if, if you try to lock them in on that, the reader could have a bad experience with your book, and that could mean they don't, you know, they give you a bad review or something similar. Great. Thank you. Um, there's a bit of a follow-up question that Ted posted. Uh, if I upload my book as a Word document, does an editor review it to make suggestions? No. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, we don't, have, we don't do, provide any sort of editing services. Uh, we don't. We we do kind of uh, check the content of the book to make sure it, it fits guidelines uh, for some of the rules that our our vendors have uh, as as far as content goes. Um, those are mostly automated scans with some humanized that come along afterward. But that's pretty much all we we don't actually read it for uh, quality or doing quality checks or edit checks or anything like that. So you're going to want to find a good editor to help you out with that stuff before you uh, upload your manuscript. Great, right, thank you. And and this is a comment. So um, Martha asked this. It, it I had to scroll down to to see that one. It's sort of related to something Dan already mentioned, uh, but it ties into this question as well. And it's related to how does draft to digital work with the retailers to help get promo ops uh, like the ones that you may get direct. Um, this this was came from Kelly and Jay, um, but also Martha asked a very similar question um, along those lines. That was basically how to take advantage of those uh, of those promos. Well, I mentioned earlier the pre-orders are one of the things that people just aren't taking advantage of enough. There's a lot of the different marketing opportunities that are present at the retailers that are just determined on the number of pre-orders you get. And so you want to make sure you have uh, pre-orders. Just uh, you know, really push those. Make sure your website, uh, you've got links to all the vendors. Make sure on your social media you're linking to all the vendors. Uh, the Universal Book Links we keep mentioning are a good way to do that. Uh, because the retailers really do go out and check when we send something to their merchandisers, they go look at your page. And if you're only sending people to Amazon, then they're not going to select you. Um, another thing you want to do is you want to make sure you've got a, a wide variety of uh, price points and uh, different formats available. And what I mean by that is there are some of the promotions that are only for book bundles. And so a book bundle is a really good thing for promotions because uh, you can have a higher price. You can have $9.99 for like the first three books. You can have $19.99. Uh, you know, I've known people that are selling, you know, all of their series for like $29.99. Um, the great thing with draft to digital is your royalty stays the same no matter if it's above $9.99. Um, and so you're still getting paid the same amount. Um, there are people, especially for whatever reason, readers on Kobo buy a ton of bundles. It's always in our outliers for the month is several bundle sets. Um, some of those promotions out there are just bundle specific. And, you know, with a bundle, uh, you can have a higher price point and lower it a little bit. And it's still a great deal to uh, readers out there. Um, with all of the other types of promotions, um, kind of like I was saying earlier, we email right now to let people know what's available. Um, uh, we've moved over to this form system, and so you just fill in, you know, the title of the book, the ISBN, uh, what the current price is, and what uh, promotional price you will offer for this particular promotion uh, with a lot of them. Um, some of the special promotions are a little bit different than that. Um, like when we work with the libraries, they generally will just say, you know, a percentage off of the library retail price. Um, and so we kind of let you know in those emails what the requirements are. Great. Uh, a little bit of a quick follow-up question to you talking about bundles. And um, uh, I already asked, uh, bundles versus box sets. Yeah, so how are, we, how are we defining yeah. those two? <laughs> I, I, I think for the most part that we yeah. mean the same thing when we say yeah. it, like either yeah. way. Um, there is the question of a lot of times when we're talking about bundles or box sets, we're talking about with your own books. Uh, but there are people that do bundles with other authors as well. Right. And, and I mean, I come from traditional print book selling. A box set is actually books in a box that are, yeah. and, and, and so, so like I always uh, try the semantics for me are, well, it's not really a box set. It's a, it's a digital bundle. <laughs> so uh, for, for me, I have a different take on that because of my, my, my legacy in, 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 you know, stocking dead trees 
on shelves. Um, this question came in live from Anna. And uh, is there any way to alter the copyright page? Um, I asked because I'd like to alter the info on there. And when I remove that option and create my own copyright page, I can't format it. It becomes problematic when I create a PDF for a paperback version that may be released on another day or a different edition. So, okay. I, I'm, tr I'm kind of trying to wrap my head around what the other, the second half of the problem was. So when she removes the option and creates her own copyright page, she, she can't format what exactly that page or the, cause I know that if you provide your own EPUB, you know, it's kind of locked. We can't alter that on your behalf or anything. Uh, but if you, if you're creating your own copyright page and including it with your manuscript, you would just have to edit it in the original manuscript and re upload the manuscript. Right. But I may be oversimplifying her question. <laughs> yeah, that may be something we may have to answer offline, uh, like look at the specific details. Uh, Anna, well. if you'll email support at drafttodigital.com, real life human beings will help you yeah. answer this question yeah. if we can. <laughs> real life human <laughs> beings that aren't on the spot trying to not over They're the all technology. watching us right now, so I'm, I'm <laughs> sure there's like spitballs and other things flying at the screen right now. <laughs> All right, so this is a sort of a generic indie publishing question. I mean, it's been a hot button topic for a long, long time. And it's the overview of uh, basic pros and cons of being wide versus exclusive to Amazon. And this uh, was uh, the style of question that came in from Evelyn and Liz and Rohi. And, and I guess in a nutshell, I kind of look at it from, from two different perspectives. Um, Amazon is the world's biggest bookstore. And... Oftentimes when you're digital publishing, when you're self-publishing, it's really, really hard to, to learn everything at once. So oftentimes you go, okay, well, why don't we start with the big bookstore and I'll publish there first and then I'll get used to it and I'll get to understand the business. And then once I become comfortable with it, well, A, if I'm uh, making six and seven figure incomes from that, then I'm done. Uh, but after that, once I've gotten used to it, then maybe I can expand my horizons because it's hard enough to learn one before learning others. So one of the benefits of of being exclusive to Amazon is that yes, you get access to Kindle unlimited page reads, which work really well for some people, particularly if they have a lot of books in a series and you get access to promos that Amazon's not going to give you unless you're exclusive, like making your book free for five days. Um, whereas Amazon does not let you set the, the book uh, lower than 99 cents at all, but the other retailers do. And through draft to digital, you, you can uh, do that. You can't set it to free on Amazon. It'll actually, uh, uh, we'll have to submit them a 99 cent price even if you make it free because that's their policy. But they do aggressive price matching. So a lot of times authors who want to have a free first book in series will use wide distribution to force Amazon uh, to price match to, uh, to free. So it, it's kind of funny. You can use Amazon's uh, archaic ways uh, uh, in, in a way that benefits you uh, with the other retailers. The pros for me of going wide to publish to the other platforms is uh, you know, I'm, I'm in Canada and, and I used to work at Kobo. So guess what? I own a Kobo and, you know, 98% of my digital library is uh, Kobo. So my default store when I hear about a book that I want to read is I'm probably going to buy it on Kobo. And so if your book is only on Amazon, it doesn't matter how appealing the book is to me. I'm not going to go and buy a Kindle or I'm not going to switch platforms just to buy your book. I'll just go and buy another book that is in the same vein because, you know, we're not just competing uh, with other books. We're competing with other things that are going to get our attention. So for me, um, when as an author myself, if if and I'm not a big name author, so if somebody is interested in buying my book and they go to Apple or they go to Amazon or they go to Kobo or they go to Nook or they go to wherever they go to to buy their ebooks, I want them to make sure there's no excuse not to find me. Uh, so that's why why it is important uh, to me. You now I've been talking. I didn't get, give you guys a chance to to talk about this one, or should we move on to the next one? I think it's an important one. I mean, that is the quintessential question we have to answer at conferences a lot. And so uh, that's kind of the heart of who we are, honestly. Yeah, we, we are <laughs> champions for going wide, but we also uh, we're not evangelical about it. We're not telling you wide is the only answer. And in fact, uh, we think the future is hybrid in many ways. It's hybrid in the sense that Many of you are going to, at some point in your life, do a traditional deal as well as be self-published. Um, if you are already traditional, most of you are going to self-publish at some point in your life. Um, 
as long as KU is working the way it is, probably you're going to have some books in KU and some books wide. It's going to be really the best strategy. Uh, it seems to be like a different group of readers, maybe a new group of readers that are in KU. Um, and so uh, what I encourage people to do is consult their peers within their genre because it's very different from genre to genre where the readers are uh, and go from there. Um, we're big fans of wide. I think the number one thing that drives me nuts about Amazon exclusivity is that for some reason they choose to include libraries as their enemy. And so right. if you have your book in Amazon exclusive, you can't sell your books to libraries. That's I grew up going to libraries. Book, right? We were very poor when I was young. The way I got to be a lifelong reader was through the library system. And we love libraries. They're great for discovery. Um, and so uh, being wide, you get to participate in that and try to sell your book digitally. Um, Mark mentioned uh, the exclusivity is just digital. You can have your book ready in print and libraries might buy it. Although libraries don't buy if you're only listed in Kindle, uh, Kindle direct print. Is that what they call it? KDP I think print. that's KDP, KDP print. print. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, you it would should be. need to have it listed with someone else for a library to buy it because they don't buy things with CreateSpace or with uh, Amazon now, uh, ISBNs. Okay. I just want to pop this up because this is kind of related. So Allison uh, commented that I've been wide from day one and I actually sell more on Kobo than any other retailer. And Allison, I'm glad you mentioned that because it is true. There are authors where Apple is their best retailer, where Nook is their best retailer, where Kobo is their best retailer, and they would not have had that had they gone exclusive to another retailer, right? They might not have even known that their their customers, their people, their tribe, the ones who love their books more than anyone uh, are on a different platform. So I think that's also an important uh, an important um, thing to consider. Looks like we have a couple of questions in the comments that I think are, are great ones. To, uh, yeah. If you can pull uh, some of those up. Yeah, I wanted to uh, I wanted to go to, uh, should I jump into the audio book one, or should we just stay on this sure. topic for one more second? In terms uh, there, of there was one about libraries so I think we should hit on. Um, okay, from, uh, uh, from Ted. Ted. Okay, let me uh, bring that one up. Uh, thanks, Dan. All right, so Ted says, I notice libraries have a listing of the number of copies they have uh, for distribution at a given time. Do libraries purchase the number of copies they want to be able to lend? Do they pay special rates? If so, who decides it? Yeah, and that's a great segue into how we work with libraries. Definitely. So with the digital library systems, how it works right now for most of them is they buy a single copy, and that copy they can lend out to someone, but while someone has it uh, out, uh, no one else can, can get it. Um, if they have enough demand for that title, they might buy multiple copies. And so that's kind of – it's, it's – the digital copy will be in their library system uh, effectively forever uh, when you sell it through draft to digital or as an indie. Um, but only one person can check it out at a time. Um, this is going to be to the, like each individual library purchases what's going to show up in their digital uh, system. Um, some of the uh, different vendors are starting to experiment with models that are a little bit like Kindle Unlimited where anyone uh, where you as an author get paid out based on if someone checks out your book and is reading it. And that allows unlimited numbers of it to be checked out to their patrons. Uh, but anytime anyone's reading it, you're getting paid for it. And so uh, we think that's going to be really good for indies and expand the amount of readers they're going to have access to. Um, so that's all changing a little bit. The cool thing with libraries is you get to set your own price. It's a separate price from your retail list price. Uh, it doesn't, trigger price matching anywhere. Um, generally, the traditional publishers are uh, charging anywhere from $50 to $100 uh, for uh, their books selling to libraries in digital formats. Um, we encourage people, you know, it's probably, you want, to, you want your library price to be considerably higher than your normal retail list price because they are going to have it forever. They're going to be lending it out to multiple people. Um, and so that's something, and you get to choose that. Uh, it's basically just one of the fields when you're setting up uh, to go to Overdrive and to, um, where all do we go? We go to Overdrive, Biblioteca, um, we've got Hoopla Baker and Beta, Taylor. and we've got yeah. one other, Baker, oh, Baker and Taylor. Baker and so, Taylor. Yeah. so you get to set that different library price. 
Okay, excellent. And and just to, just to point out, uh, we actually had um, a few other people, uh, Jeremiah and Karen, for example, had asked the same sort of question about how can DDD help get my book uh, into library? So that covers that um, as well. We will carry, physically carry <laughs> your book into our local library branches and leave it there. So we're going we're gonna to take a different turn right now. So there's both a pre-question uh, that Anne-Marie, uh, Kathy, Anne, Austin, Liz, Katie, and Peter asked. Uh, Google Play, basically, they were asking, well, what the heck is up with that? What's the latest? And also, uh, Mark just uh, posted that as well. Any news on Google Play Books? So it's, uh, this is the Google section. Uh, can we give an update on, uh, on Google Play, uh, Dan? So, <laughs> Google Play, uh, we are working hard at it. Like, we've got developers that have been just chipping away at that all summer. Uh, the things they're asking us to do right now are very difficult, and it's a very... Um, it's a manual process. Uh, manual and arduous process. Yeah. Um, we don't have any promises. We're working on it as hard as we can. Um, you know, we hope to continue to offer it to everyone. Uh, but it's, uh, they're making it particularly difficult. Okay. But we, we are coming to some solutions and it, it will, it will be happening soon. We're, we've got, uh, processes in place to help automate a lot of what Google wants us to do. Uh, and then I think we're kind of in a position to do that. I'm just going to say it. We're going to do it better than anybody else out there is going to be able to do it. So, <laughs> uh, it's so awkward it. though. It is awkward. <laughs> So yeah, it's awkward. Yeah, they, well, yeah we, it's, we it's want to make hoops. things really easy and yeah. simple for you authors because, uh, you know, simplicity yeah. means it's quick and your time is your money. And but, man, they're not helping us with it. Yeah, <laughs> we want to stress that this is Google making this difficult. So I don't think anybody really questioned that, but it's definitely Google making everything difficult. I suspect maybe Google. they have hidden cameras in our office, and then every time they change how they want to do things, they they, they giggle and watch us jumping through all these hoops. They and twirl their mustaches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this is a question that comes up a lot. Um, and, and this was asked by Robert and Steve uh, and Lewis. And it's basically, how do I get uh, books uh, on a bookstore and retail bookshelves like Walmart and, and places like that? Will Create Space Expanded Distribution, or now known as KDP it, Print it, Expanded oh, Distribution? Oh, I was going to say, it will not because it doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, exactly. Create Space doesn't exist anymore. Um, no, um, and, and it won't. But uh, but what what is, what are some options that authors have uh, in, in to, to try to get books into stores? I'm, I'm going to start off with this one and kind of explain the difference between traditional book uh, distribution and, and print-on-demand distribution. And, and the fact is, is that the one thing that um, traditional publishers do really, really well is they are the purveyors of risk because in the book industry, returns are a major, major issue and, and billions of dollars are, are spent or, or billions of dollars are burned uh, due to returns because a bookstore can stock a book for six to nine months and then return it back to the publisher if it doesn't sell. And when I first did print on demand in 2004, I thought I was really smart. I went through Ingram. I set up my book with a full discount. And I made it fully returnable. And it was really awesome when uh, Canada's largest retailer ordered 600 copies of my book. And they went into the stores, and I was really happy, and I did a little happy dance. And then three months later, when half of those books came back, and the cost for them coming back to me was more than the money I earned on them going out, and I was in the hole for a long, long time, it wasn't as fun. And so the challenge with books and bookstores and bookshelves is that discount. Uh, and the other challenge when it comes to KDP extended distribution, which will put it through an Ingram system where people can order it, um, is they don't give you the full discount. They, they, Amazon doesn't want you to buy the book at a bookstore. Amazon wants you to buy the book from Amazon. And bookstores don't want to buy from the competitor that's trying to put them out of business. Bookstores want to buy from distributors like Ingram. So, um, so Dan, Kevin, considering those challenges, what are some of the ways uh, that people can maybe get their print-on-demand book at least listed through traditional uh, book uh, chains? So I, I would say it's probably more effort than it's worth. And so I would highly encourage you, a lot of book buying, like print as well as digital, is just moving to online. Uh, now that so many of the different retailers out there will uh, can deliver to you in two days or less. Um, the days of like the walk into a bookstore, 
uh, set up are going to, they're limited now. Uh, I think we're going to see Barnes and Noble have a much smaller footprint as far as the number of books they have in them. Uh, they're going to be smaller stores. Um, yeah. That being said, like if you want to get into the bookstores, uh, a, it's not going to work with expanded distribution because most of the bookstores, most of the libraries aren't going to order from Amazon if it's just listed through Amazon for print. Um, and so you either want to go directly to Ingram Spark for your wide distribution of your print book um, or sign up for our print beta. Uh, our print beta gets your books wide as well. Um, we're continuing to, to hammer away at print because uh, we do think it's really good to have your book available in all possible formats. Uh, you want print book, you want digital book, you want audio book. The really neat thing uh, on a lot of the different storefronts is if you have a print book, uh, like especially Amazon will show you, hey, it's a, you know it's nineteen ninety nine for the print, but if you buy the digital, you're saving you know fifteen dollars because it's four ninety nine. Right. Um, right. There are readers that just want to read in print, and so I, I, we think you should have your print available on demand. Um, the great thing about print on demand is there's no risk to you, like. Yeah, you're not having to deal with that return system that Mark mentioned. Um, yeah, in a lot of cases, those returns weren't even like we call them returns, but they just get destroyed after the bookstore doesn't sell them. And then either your publisher or you, if you're the one who's doing it, uh, are just out that money and owe the money to the bookstore. So, right. So that um, ext the ex the expanded distribution means that your book is available for those bookstores to order. That, which is not necessarily a guarantee that that book's going to be ordered by that bookstore. Um, but one thing you can do uh, that is it's a little bit limited because there's only one of you and only so much time. Uh, but one way you can start getting your book into physical bookstores is to start making arrangements to do signings at, um, at stores, uh, start locally, and then you could expand outward. I know it's a little bit like it's almost – uh, a little like the days of buying a bunch of self-published copies and driving around with them in the trunk of your car. But uh, <laughs> what it does is introduce you to more and more people who are in charge of organizing these events. Barnes & Noble, for example, they have a whole division of Barnes & Noble that's about organizing this stuff. Uh, so you begin to create relationships with these people. And if you have a signing that goes particularly well, uh, it gets noticed, and so over time, just like uh, marketing in general, it's this slow, like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill. You know, you might you might actually reach the top and roll right on on over, and then gravity takes over. Um, but what happens a lot of times is you you do these little. So like I I spent about two years driving around and doing signings at small bookstores and local bookstores in various towns, but a couple of Barnes and Nobles and that sort of thing. And my books kind of linger. They kind of stick around uh, because they're not a big investment by the bookstore. They'll buy like, you know, a handful of copies uh, and they're all print on demand. They're, they kind of just stick around and stay in the bookstore. So if someone happens to discover it or go in and ask for it, uh, it can it can benefit you. So I want to say like we're getting towards the end of the broadcast. Uh, we're yeah. down to kind of like the last seven minutes or so. Um, in the live comments, uh, if you're if you're not following the live comments, we've listed the the uh, web address to join our print beta, which is drafttodigital.com slash print beta. If you're interested in that, um, we had a couple of questions about audio, and we reached out to our friends at Find a Way. Do we want to uh, address that now? Yeah, and actually, I'll, I'll pop up the question that's sort of uh, related to that. So Jess asked, uh, since audiobook markets are expanding a lot right now, does that impact your recommendations regarding wide? or Amazon exclusive related to audiobooks. And then I'm gonna dig into that other audio question that we know we had uh, earlier, which is sort of marketing suggestions or uh, tips for um, audiobooks specifically. Uh, and and uh, I think Kevin's got some uh, cool stuff related. To I that. have an official statement from Find Away Voices, who are sort of our official unofficial audiobook partners. Uh, and I'll read it out loud now. Uh, <laughs> the biggest untapped opportunity for many authors is to really take the time to understand the retailers and business models, quotes, uh, we, give, we give them access to, then have that inform their marketing. There's a world of diff difference between encouraging someone to make an a la carte purchase versus checking out your book for free at a library or through a subscription service like Scribd. Is it Scribd or Scribd? Scribd, I think. Scribd. I'm going to go with Scribd. 
and your marketing needs to uh, your marketing needs to take that into account. Uh, I'm going to add to this that um, audiobook marketing is really functionally not any different from marketing your ebooks, print books, or or anything else really. Uh, it is marketing. Uh, we like to define as uh, improving the odds that the right reader will find your book at the right time. Uh, the same thing applies to audiobooks. But you, he, uh, Will from Findaway, is is saying you need to take into account the strategy that you have for uh, both short term and long term in terms of how you want to grow. Um, if your if your biggest thing is you want to attract as many listeners as possible in a short time as possible, that changes the approach you take to marketing your audiobooks, um, and it usually means raising the cost of your marketing. I'm a big fan of slow burn, uh, long strategy marketing, uh, which means that, you know, have just really just having an audiobook available alongside your, your print and ebooks is very beneficial to you. Because as Dan mentioned earlier, you get sort of a comparison shopper thing going on on the uh, product page of a book if the audio is also included. So uh, it becomes an additional marketing tool. I would say on the question of the wide versus exclusive, uh, particular to audiobooks, I do think that's the most important choice authors have to make in the next few years is um, if you go with ACX and Audible, they have a, a, an option to be exclusive where you get paid more. But it's a seven-year uh, term. You know, when we talk about... Uh, Kindle uh, Select and Kindle Unlimited, that's a 90 day. 90 days, experiment, do whatever. It's not a very long time. But seven years of being exclusive as the audiobook market is just uh, really taking off right now, I would highly encourage people to really think about that choice um, because uh, there's so many other opportunities. There are subscription services around the world that are taking off. Uh, platforms like Scribd, like Storytel, uh, all the library systems now are doing audiobooks and digital. Um, I would not just limit yourself. Um, I think, Mark, you've had a lot of success with your audiobooks in libraries. Uh, yeah, libraries and even not uh, not the big places. I thought, okay, Audible and uh, Apple and Kobo and places like that. But no, I've been making most of my audiobook money off of library distribution and, and yep. other platforms that I'm, I had never even heard of. Um, and and that's kind of interesting to see. The other thing too is there's a difference between 90 days of exclusivity and seven years, right? Yeah. That's a different. Uh, uh, so much can change in uh, actually in 90 days, but so much can change in in seven years. So I wanted to because uh, we're getting close to the end. We had marketing questions. We actually had uh, hundreds of marketing questions, <laughs> yeah. and 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 we did actually have some uh, ready to talk about. And we did talk a little bit about marketing because you can't help it uh, as you're talking about selling books, but. We will be doing a marketing only, so no conversion questions, no other questions about that, but just marketing. No questions about pants or anything no, else. No questions about people's beards or, or what's their marketing pants. Yeah. So we will be doing a very specific focused marketing hour long where we'll be uh, taking some of the questions that came in uh, as well as uh, taking your live questions. But we did want to thank you guys so much for uh, for hanging out with us today and remind you that you guys, uh, you, you can have access to us for half hour, one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations. You can ask any specific questions to to Dan or Mark or Kevin. And, and uh, the link is going to be popped up. Uh, Alyssa, thank you very much for supporting us uh, by, by pu pushing those buttons for us, is going to pop that up into the comments where you can click through and using Calendly, you'll be able to uh, book a session of different time zones, different times of the day, where you can book a one-on-one -on -one chat with us so we can dig into details and we can even look at, okay, well, look at your specific situation and whatever it is. I mean, if you want to talk scotch or beards or, or whatever, we're up for that too, but we'd love to be able to help you in your writing journey and in your writing path. Any any closing words, uh, Mr. I Mr. do, Thomas, I do want to say Lord? we're... We're going to be shutting the consult link won't last forever. Uh, so and it's really only for the folks who are here right now. So get in there and register as quickly as you can for a, a time slot. And uh, what was our time? For, what, what did we say was going to be the time frame for that? Uh, for uh, when it was going to get shut down? Yeah, that's a good say? question. Uh, it could be it could be within the next hour, probably. So those live people have an opportunity to click that link. And 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 uh, and bookmark it so they can uh, they can check out the calendars and and book some time to chat with us a video chat one on one 
uh, as well. We do plan on doing more of these. It could be audio uh, if you if you don't want to. Yeah. Uh, you can if phone you're, in. If you don't want a camera, right? You don't. If you don't want us to see you. That's fine. we'll be doing it through Zoom, so you can do it from a computer, a mobile device, or there are phone numbers you can call, and we'll we'll set up a. F- I want to put this out there. I want to emphasize this is a free, free thirty minute author consultation. We're not going to charge you any money, like forty nine bucks, like some other uh, organizations out there. This is free. It's free, which is kind of cool. And thanks, guys, sir. So many amazing questions. Uh, so you'll probably be hearing from us directly. And and we'll be addressing uh, some of the questions in forthcoming blog posts uh, as well that we'll be sharing. So keep an eye on our Facebook page. Keep an eye on the Draft to Digital blog. And thank you, guys. Dan? Yeah, we, Kevin, we're looking at doing this yeah. um, once a month. Uh, so yeah. this is going to be an ongoing thing. Uh, we've really wanted to bring some of the experience um, – that we we get out at conferences uh, you know many of you we have got to meet one-on-one and have these conversations with and answer these questions but there's a lot of you that just you know maybe you live on the far side of the world uh maybe you just don't have the time or the money right now to go to conferences that's what this session is for and so we're going to be doing these we haven't set a specific date for the next one right but um it'll be sometime in uh mid to late this was July. letting us work out some of the kinks and bugs yeah. and we've already learned a lot um especially <laughs> yeah. about shutting uh, uh shutting down the uh questions uh the pre-written questions a little early uh because we were <laughs> that was that was looking like it was going to get pretty large so i'm glad everybody uh got excited about this I, we are all very excited about this everybody at the draft to digital offices is watching us they're excited about this a little mad at us for some of the things we've mentioned. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> uh, but yes, we're going to be back and we're going to do a, a marketing focused one and probably a lot more. So uh, thanks for tuning in for this. And Dan thank you. and Kevin and Alyssa, thank you guys so much uh, for this. It's been amazing. And you authors, thank you. We couldn't do what we do if we didn't have your great books that we could share with the world and with readers. So we could all it, the best. Lonely. Yeah, it would be very, very lonely. So all the best to all of you guys. Thanks for hanging out with us today. And uh, we will catch you uh, next time. Later. Cheers.